So I'm a writer, and I focus really on contemporary arts engagement with computational culture and technology. And for the first edition of the Sleuths magazine, I wrote an essay providing a brief context for the distribution of art online. And most recently, I wrote a review of Manfred Moore's exhibition at Carol Fletcher for Saturation Point. So today, I've chosen to speak about Ellen Ullman's memoir, Close to the Machine, Technophilia and its Discontents. It was published in 1997, the publication date neatly preceding the first dot-com boom. Almond was an engineer in Silicon Valley when Google would have been a completely meaningless word, never mind verb, before Mark Zuckerberg was even in high school, before the plastic bubble of the iMac was available to buy in a choice of colours, and before computing became such an integral part of our everyday lives. As much as the context makes Almond's meditate Mediations, a historical account of sorts, for me there is an importance to be attached to this text. It's a time when the Western world was in the midst of a major cultural shift. It was sort of the beginnings of the second coming of the, the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s. And it's also interesting to see her viewpoints as a woman working in a field that was mainly dominated by men, and also her position just as a human being trying to figure out how to make machines useful in our messy, irrational and complex lives. Writing codes can carry the aura of being something mysterious, mathematical, and objective, when you consider it as a product separate from the labor used to create it. The slick interfaces we use today have amassed hours of human labor in their production. Almond's memoir reveals that being a software engineer is a labor-intensive activity, which seemingly involves losing all track of time or reality, Almond recounts. Joel and I started this round of debugging on Friday morning. Sometime later, maybe Friday night, another programmer, Danny, came to work. I suppose it must be Sunday by now, because it's been a while since we've seen my clients' employees around the office. Along the way, at odd times of day or night, that may have completely escaped us, we've ordered three Chinese meals, eaten six large pizzas, had innumerable bottles of fizzy water, and finished two entire bottles of wine. It has occurred to me that if people knew how software was written, I'm not sure they'd give their money to a bank or even get on an aeroplane again. Alman goes on to detail the technical purgatory that they are in. They try solutions and nothing works. It feels like whatever is causing the problem in their system, it just can't be fixed. She describes a colleague sat in front of his screen with 15 windows open full of code on his desktop. He has overpopulated his eyes, thoughts and imagination. He is drowning in bugs. I find this observation particularly amusing and both tragic because having loads of windows open with lots of information streaming on all of them is a behaviour that we can perhaps all relate to in varying degrees and we're not even software engineers. And this memoir, this memoir is written before it even became culturally acceptable in our leisure time to sit staring at a computer for hours at a lot of information often with absolutely no breaks. It occurred to me at some point, whilst reading this book, that Almond never mentions what the software is for that they're, that they're working on and who will be using it during this particular bug-fixing marathon with no end. It felt like their approach to writing software was really abstract, completely removed from reality, and com completely removed from the context in which whatever software they're writing will actually be used. Code just becomes lines of text and logic, just assumed parameters, variables, and functions. Further on, she reflects on being trapped in this limited mindset, and I often wonder, actually, if these, if these thoughts were what led her to write this memoir in the first place. It turns out, further on in the book, it's revealed that the software they're creating is to register AIDS patients on a central database. Almond has anxieties about creating a secure system for such sensitive data. She also has anxieties about her own approach to problem solving and engineering, one where the actual users of technology and software, of what they have designed, and of what they have designed become irrelevant. They're just, they're just an end product that they don't want to think about. And there's something that can get in the way of a well-oiled logic machine that is always driving towards future technological excellence. I'm continually anxious, she writes. How do we protect this database full of the names of people with AIDS? Is a million dollar computer system the best use of continually shrinking funds? It was easier when I didn't have to think about the real world effect of my work. It was easier, and I got paid more, when I was writing an abstracted interface to any arbitrary input device. 
defining a test bed methodology, which kind of sounds like a bit of gobbledygook. I could disappear into weird passions of logic. I could stay in a world peopled entirely by programmers, other weird logic dreamers like myself, all caught up in our own inner eccentricities. It was easier and more valued. In my profession, software engineering, there is something almost shameful in this helpful social services system we are building. The whole project smacks of end users, those contemptible, oblivious people who just want to use the stuff we write and don't even care how we did it. She is suggesting that there is no prestige, therefore, in considering software useful in reality, unless the closed circle of the profession are impressed by the logic written in the software. Looking at the idea of being trapped in our own inner eccentricities in terms of our current relationship with computing is quite an interesting one. It's something that is currently spoken about in relation to how we access a new content online. The term filter bubble has been used to describe the way in which social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, limit the future information we see on our feeds by showing us replications of what we've already looked at or liked, what our friends like, or by what is most popular across the network, globally, internationally, regionally, or locally. Despite the internet being a mass of divergent information where you could hypothetically access anything you want, these platforms prioritize the content we view based much on what we've already looked at. Once you're in a filter bubble, it becomes difficult to escape, much like the programmer that Ullman has described. He sat focused on one tiny little bug in a software system that, in fact, has endless amounts of code, workings, and an ultimate use in the, in the real world. In a filter bubble, you become directed to focus on a narrow amount of things. The online world reflects back to us our own inner eccentricities, a culture of endless solipsism, or in other words, a culture where only you are able to exist. So in terms of our historical references, and to bring things back to imagery, rather than just text, I am reminded here of, of a Victorian painting, The Mirror of Venus by Edward Burne Jones, where a group of women just surround a pool of water only to look at their reflections. As I said at the beginning, it could be easy to see Ullman's memoir as a historical account. However, when you look at the, the text more closely, you can see nuances of societal trends, questions and problems, just simmering to the surface over 20 years ago. What might have been a niche concern before has now become a societal concern or a norm. For me, Close to the Machine is an important document articulating a threshold moment in Western culture. Almond's personal observations allow us to reflect on how much computational culture has become normalised and just a part of everyday life. It moves and it moves away from sci-fi imaginations of the future, like, as promoted by writers like William Gibson. Whether that is a positive or negative development is up to the reader. That's it. <laughs>